Father, we love you, Lord, and we are just so grateful, Lord God, just to come before you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you again just for, Lord, you continuing to have your way in our lives, Lord. We need you, Lord. I truly believe more than ever before, specifically as we look around and we see chaos, not only outside our country, but even within our country, people hurting, people suffering. Lord, we pray for your mercy. We pray for your involvement. We pray that the Lord Jesus would come soon. Help us, Lord. Help us to be ready. Help us to take, stay close to you. Help us, again, to continue to hear and learn and grow in the knowledge of your word, Lord, that we would be made more and more like Jesus. We love you. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I don't know if you heard the news, but baseball season is back. Did you guys hear that? Now, the reason I'm wearing my Dodger blue up here again is for a reason. This morning, with baseball season being back, I'm going to throw you guys a curveball. And so I know a lot of you are right now in Acts chapter 4. You can hold your place there, but let's turn to Joshua chapter 7. Okay, here's a little curveball for you. Let's turn to Joshua chapter 7. We are going to come back to, to Acts chapter 4, pick it up right where we left off. But I want to kind of throw something at you this morning, which I think will prepare us for our text. And so Joshua chapter 7, Joshua chapter 7, as you turn there, I'm going to give you some background. Okay, in Joshua chapter 7, the Israelites under the leadership of Joshua, have just entered into the promised land, okay? Something they had been looking forward to, again, uh, you know, 40 years, and, and uh, you know, God saw them through the wilderness, again, second generation of Israelites, finally able to enter in, and so it was, it was a new beginning. It, it was an awesome time. You have to understand the, the, the celebration and what it must have felt like for them to finally receive the promise that they had been waiting for. And so in this new beginning, in chapter 6, they enter the promised land, and they come up against their first enemy, and that is the city of Jericho. We know the story. They march around the wall seven times. The walls come down. God gives them victory over the city of Jericho. Again, excitement. God was with them. God was moving, and they had to have been expecting victory after victory. I mean, because there's victory in Jesus, right? There's victory in the Lord. But then we come to chapter 7. And in chapter 7, the unexpected happens. They come up against their next enemy. It's a city known as Ai. And they're defeated. They lose. They lose the battle. And it, it hit them like a ton of bricks. It shocked them. This is not what they were expecting. And so Joshua goes before the Lord asking him why. It's, and it's a good example of what we should do. When we struggle, when we deal with things, we got to go back before the Lord. And so God speaks to him in verse 10. Joshua 7, verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. And so if you have a pen, underline those words. Very important. Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen, if you have a pen, underline stolen, and lied, underline lied, and put them among their own belongings. There was sin in the camp, and that sin affected the children of Israel. Okay, So often people say, well, Sin is personal. It's my business what I do, right? It's nobody else's business. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Sin will always affect those around us, okay? Very important lesson. The sin of one person, which we're going to read about next, affected the rest of the nation of Israel. And so sin needed to be dealt with. And so God instructed Joshua how to identify where the sin was. That's verses uh, 12 through 18. And then in verses 19, after finding the person, verse 19, Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil, a beautiful cloak from Shinar, and 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. 
Then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth beside my tent, inside my tent, with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent. And behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel. And they laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all of Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the cloak, and the bar of gold, and his sons, and daughters, and his oxen, and donkeys, and sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his anger. In other words, because sin had been dealt with, then the Lord turned from his anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. Powerful story, scary story. God doesn't play with sin. Sin must be dealt with because God is a holy God. And that's important because we live in a time specifically where even Christians say, what's the big deal? Everyone's doing it. Come on, God. And they take sin lightly. And this is scary. Because just as sin of one man in Israel affected all of Israel, the sin of one person in the church will affect the whole church. So it needs to be dealt with, okay? Sin must be confronted. Now the reason I bring this story up is because remember the story. Israel was in a new beginning. Brand new in the promised land. And so, sin needed to be, we would say it this way, nipped in the bud, right? It needed to be dealt with. As we turn now to Acts chapter 4, the church is in a new beginning, isn't it? It's brand new. It's brand new. And so sin must be dealt with. Because in the same way that Satan influenced Achan, Satan will influence believers within the church if they're not careful. And so this morning, again, very, very important. It is a warning. It is a lesson. And if you consider yourself a Christian today, which I hope all of you do, this is for you, okay? This is for me. Let me back up and remind you again what we've covered so we tie everything in. If you've been with us over the last couple chapters, we saw the coming of the Holy Spirit. We saw the birth of the church, and it's been awesome, right? The church is on fire, we would say. God is moving. Good things are happening. God is at work, and the church is growing both spiritually, which is most important, and also physically or numerically. We have read that the church went from 120 believers in Jerusalem, and it's now over 10,000. Blowing up, right? This is now a a mega church. Now, because God was moving and the church was growing, it was a threat to Satan. Satan sees the work of God and the people of God as a threat, which is why, if you were with us just the last two weeks, Satan began to do what he could to oppose the church, to stop the work of God. And we read about the first persecution That took place. You might remember they had Peter and John arrested and put on trial before the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish Supreme Court. It was there, we read, in chapter 4, 17 and 18, but in order that it may spread no further among the people. What? The gospel. In order that the gospel may spread no further among the people, let us warn them. This is what the Jewish council said. Let us warn them. Peter and John, but all believers, to speak no more to anyone in this name. What name? Jesus. 
So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They warned them. They threatened them. But let me ask you, did it work? No. Okay? No, it did not work. We read 19 and 20. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you guys rather than to God, you must judge. You decide for yourself. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. It was beautiful, right? We've seen the boldness of these common fishermen, right? Standing before the most powerful men in Israel. That council expected Peter and John to, to, you know, shake at the knee, to cower before them. But that's not what happened. Filled with God's spirit, right? They did not apologize. They did not make bargains with them. They did not compromise in any way. They stood up to these religious bullies, right? And told them, we're going to obey God. God had called us to be witnesses, and that's what we're going to do. It was beautiful. Well, the council, remember, was unable to do anything. They hadn't broken any laws, so they released them. And when they gathered back together with the rest of the group, right, specifically the apostles, maybe many of the close disciples, they had a prayer meeting. And it was beautiful, right? That's what we need to be doing, gathering together, praying together, believing God together. And what was so amazing about this prayer meeting is they had just experienced persecution. But instead of doing what many people do today, right? You go through a trial and you're like, God, get me out of this trial. God, don't, let any, don't send any more trials my way. That's not what they did. They recognized that if trials and persecution hit Jesus, then it is also the plan of God for trials and persecution to come against followers of Jesus. And God allows it, right? What doesn't kill us makes us stronger, Right? Persecution brings purification even within the church. And so they recognized it. God is going to use it for a reason. And so instead of saying, God, stop the trials, they simply asked God for the strength to endure the trials. Lord, if it's your will for us to go through trials, praise the Lord, but at least give us the strength to do what you've called us to do. And it's beautiful because those are the last verses we read last week. They're praying, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. God sent an earthquake, right? God heard their prayer, showed them that he heard their prayer. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. It was beautiful. Again, God was moving. Persecution came, but they had the victory over persecution, right? They did not cower. They were able to move forward, able to do what God had called them to do. And that's how we ended last week. But now we come to this week. Now we come to this week. One of the lessons that we better understand as Christians is that Satan, along with always continuing to oppose the work of God and attack the people of God, he's going to come against us. And when he loses, when we are able to resist the devil, the Bible says he will flee. But he's going to come back tomorrow. Do we understand that? Okay. You have the victory today, and that's all we need. We just serve Jesus one day at a time, okay? We have the victory today. He's going to come back tomorrow, and that's okay. You have the victory today. But understand, Satan is not just going to give up, okay? He just doesn't throw up the white flag. All he does is change strategies. He's going to come up with a different way to get to you, and you have to understand this. You have to be prepared for this. Now, sometimes the Bible says that Satan comes at us like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Isn't that right? Sometimes he's going to attack us from the outside, and we have to be prepared for that. And that's exactly what Satan did. He attacked them from the outside. But when that doesn't work, Satan has another strategy. 
Instead of coming at us like a roaring lion, he will come at us like an angel of light. That's what he does. He's slick, guys. Understand, he's slick. He's got a bag of tricks. And that's what he's going to do, okay? If he can't get you from the outside, he'll try to get the church from the inside. And he does that by using someone inside the church. And if he can use you to bring sin, to sin and to bring division, then it'll hinder the work of God. It might even stop the work of God. And that's exactly what we see this morning. Last week was all about reading about the persecution that came against the church from the outside. This morning, again, we will look at the opposition that comes against the church from the inside, from within. And so write this down if you're taking notes. Again, very important. I guarantee you, this is for everybody, guys. If you're a Christian, this is for all of us. We're going to be looking at Satan's attempt to hinder the work of God, okay? Satan's attempt to hinder the work of God. And the first thing we will look at is the selflessness, selflessness that was taking place. When there is selflessness within the church, within the body of Christ, it results in unity and blessing. And that's the first thing we began to see that was taking place in the church. Look at verses 32 as we pick it up right where we left off again, Acts chapter 4. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Now this is beautiful and you have to remind yourself what makes this so beautiful. It's one thing when two people have something in common, right? But how about 10,000 people? 10,000 people like-minded. 10,000 people, as Luke describes, with one heart and soul. This was unity. This was truly a united church. Now, why did this take place? Well, I read, I read something about pianos, and I thought it was kind of interesting. It said that if you grabbed 100 different pianos, but you tuned all of those 100 different pianos with the same tuning fork, that all of those 100 pianos would be tuned to one another. And it makes sense. It's beautiful, right? Jesus is our tuning fork. And we are all to be tuned into him. And when we are, again, this is what we see take place. This is fellowship. This is unity within the body of Christ. Now, John would later write about this in a verse that we should all know because it's kind of what our church is named after, right? 1 John 1, 7. But if, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. Who's the, who's the he? Jesus. If we walk in the light with Jesus, then what happens? We have fellowship with one another. Make sense? When we are in tune with him, we will be in tune with one another. But it's the big if. This is the if. This is why we need to make sure, again, we are in tune with Jesus. This is what was taking place. Now, I love this because you have to remember, this was not only 10,000 people, but if you remember Acts chapter 2, when the church was birthed, it was the day of Pentecost, remember that? There were people from all of the different nations, all of the different countries and regions of the Roman Empire who had traveled to Jerusalem for this holiday, people who were from different nations, people who spoke different languages, people who spoke different cultures. There were different ages. Of course, there were different genders. Are you with me? Differences, differences, differences. And yet, despite all of these differences, Luke tells us that they were of one heart and one soul. They were focused, led by God's Spirit. They were in unity. This is the example that we are to follow today. Someone say amen. amen. 
right? It doesn't matter what color we are. It doesn't matter what nationality we are, right? It doesn't matter what gender or age or culture we come from. None of these things matter. You know what matters? Jesus. That's what matters. Yes, we are Americans, and I'm proud to be an American, but before I'm an American, I'm a Christian. And that needs to be our focus. And when that is our focus, we're in tune with Jesus. And if we all are like that, then we will be in tune with one another. It's beautiful. And again, this is the example we find in Scripture. But one of the things I have to mention, very, very important, is unity does not mean uniformity. You understand the difference? Unity does not mean uniformity. How many of you know denominations, or even I'll use maybe Mormons as an example, who all dress the same? They all look the same. They look like they're clones. You guys with me? White shirt, right? Black pants. They look like they work at Cheesecake Factory, something like that, right? <laughs> but they're like clones. God hasn't called us to be clones. How many of you know that God made us all unique? That's a good thing, okay? God desires, right, that we be unique, but even in our uniqueness, we can still have unity if our focus is on Jesus. Now, our uniqueness, our differences are important. The Holy Spirit even gives us different spiritual gifts. Why? Because the beauty in differentness is that you have something I don't have, and I have something you don't have. And as all of us come together in unity and we share our differences, we're complete. We lack nothing. And so God is not into clones, right? God made us unique because this is how he desires that we operate. We're still me, right? You're still you. The key, though, is the focus. The key is the heart. The key, again, is that we desire to see the kingdom of God advanced even in our differences. And this is what was taking place. It was beautiful. They were united. And they were so united, right, in Jesus, in advancing God's kingdom, that guess what? They cared more about people than they did about things. Now that hits home. Now that hits home. Because we live in the the day where there are, you know, You store it's on every corner, aren't they? We're into stuff. We're into the next thing. And our heart so easily is focused on those things. The things we care about, the things we we treasure. But Lord, help us, right? Aren't people more important than things? Now that's heavy, right? They, again, had so much love for Jesus and love for one another that this was their focus. They were selfless. They were selfless. So selfless, right, that they no longer looked at their possessions as just their own. They were willing to share them to whoever had need. And this makes so much sense. Even though it's hard for us today, honestly, this makes so much sense. How many of us can say, and I'm sure you would agree with me, that we would all say right now, I belong to Jesus. Would you you say that? I think everyone would say that. I I have to hope so. But why is it that we can say, I belong to Jesus, but my stuff doesn't? Am I right? It's true. And again, I'm, I'm including me in the bunch. It's so easy to say, oh, I belong to you, Lord, right? But we struggle with our possessions. We struggle with our money. We struggle with all these things. Not them. This was their heart. They weren't selfish. They were not selfish. And they are such a beautiful example, again, for all of us today. Look at verse 33. And with great power. The apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now, something beautiful was happening, okay? Something beautiful was happening. Now, let me remind you of something. I, I like stuff like this. Always remember when, that when we read the word great in the New Testament, 
It's the Greek word mega. We, we use that word today, right? When I say mega, what do you think of? Right? That's what our thought is. And it's beautiful because Luke's going to use this word a lot. And here he says that great grace, mega charis, was upon all of them. Now, the word grace means favor. It didn't make sense. Their heart was right. They were serving Jesus. They were being generous. They were not selfish. And for that reason, they had great favor upon them. God was pleased with them, right? God was pleased with them. But get this. Not only did they have great favor with God because their hearts were right, but because their hearts were right with one another, they had favor with one another. They had favor with one another. There was no division. There was no selfishness. And not only that, all of the unbelievers around them looked at the church and their love for one another and their generosity with one another, and it had to blow them away. they never seen anything like that. You and I both know this world is dog-eat-dog, right? This world is cold-blooded. This world is, right, I'm going to get mine before anyone else does. That's this world. And they looked at something that was so different and so unique, and it was attractive. And so the actions of the church gave them favor, even with unbelievers. It was beautiful. This is what's supposed to happen. And because of the great favor, Luke says, they also had great power. Now, the word power is the Greek word dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite. And so they literally have mega dynamite. The apostles continue to use this mega dynamite as they were giving their testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. When we have favor with God and with man, we are able to have the power to declare Jesus, to preach the gospel, and people will listen. And that's what's going on. The church is exploding. God is moving And people keep getting saved day after day after day. Verse 34, there was not a needy person among them. Now that's a pretty powerful statement there. Think about what Luke is saying. There's over 10,000 people here. Some scholars, depending on who you read, say the church might have been upwards of 20,000. And there was not one need. Every need was met. That's kind of crazy. I will tell you, we're a small church, and we got a lot of needs here. They were over 10, maybe 20,000. No needs. Why? Because of what God was doing. Because the people were stepping up. Because the people, again, were not focused on themselves. They were focused on one another. Now, one of the incredible things, remember this, I shared this back in Acts chapter 2. When the church was birthed, remember, there were people from all over who were required, according to the law of Moses, to be there at Pentecost. And then they get saved. But they didn't want to go back home. Why? Because there was no church to go back home to. The only church was in Jerusalem at this time. So there were so many people that got saved, had no church to go back home to, so they stayed there but they had no jobs. They had no homes. Their homes and jobs were back home. And so there were needs. And so this explains the generosity. This explains why there was sharing to meet the needs of the people. The other thing, get this, history records that as these Jews began to convert to Christianity, they began to face sanctions. We're hearing a lot about that word today, aren't we? Sanctions. Religious sanctions from the Jews who now rejected them, but also their own families rejected them, excommunicated them, kicked them out of their homes. Many of them lost jobs. All of this began to affect the church. And yet, despite all of these needs and more people getting saved every day, Luke says there was no needs. There was crazy. There were no needs. Why? Well, keep reading. For as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. 
and it was distributed to each as any had need. Wow. Wow. And that's all I could say. Wow. The church was facing hardship. Many in the church, not everybody, but many of them. Financial hardship. Didn't have jobs. Didn't have homes. And so in response to meet the needs of those that had needs, many within the church, it says many, not everybody, many, began to sell properties they owned, began to sell maybe second homes, third homes, whatever they had. They began to sell their homes and give the proceeds to the church, right? Give it to the apostles who would distribute it to those who had needs. Now we read this and and we're like, wow. But let's be honest. How many of us would do that? Let's be honest. I don't know. I don't think I could do that. That's hard. But this was their heart. So many people today say, man, how come we don't see all the things taking place today that we saw in the book of Acts? Because we don't have hearts like they had. That's why. It's not God's fault. This is our fault. We're selfish. We're selfish. I include myself in that. We're selfish. Lord, help us, right? Our focus is on the wrong things. Remember what John said. John said in 1 John 3, 17, if anyone has material possessions, I think that's everybody, and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, we don't care. How can the love of God be in that person? What does John say? If your brother or sister have a need and you don't step up to meet the need, how can you claim that God has, God's spirit lives in you? I mean, that's real right there. That is real, but that's Bible. Remember what Jesus said, right? John 13, 34. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. I'm commanding you, he says, that you love one another. Remember, love is not a feeling. Love is an action. It's a choice that you choose to love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Jesus says, I showed you how to do it. I showed you how to do it. Now follow my example. This is what it means. This is what I expect, Jesus says. And then verse 35, by this, if you do this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. But what if we don't do that? What does that mean? It's heavy. But this is real, guys. Again, this is what we're supposed to be learning. This is, this is the example that they set for us, right? That they set for us. That we should be striving and recognize, I'm not there yet, Lord. Help me. Help my selfish heart. Change me, God. Help me to be more like you. Help us to follow the example of the church in the book of Acts. Now, one of the things I have to just add really quick, because we live in a generation today where a lot of people are talking about socialism or communistic socialism. We're hearing that a lot. It's a big buzzword today. And many say Jesus was a socialist. I've heard that. I've seen it on social media. The early church practiced socialism. And what they do is they point to this passage. This is what they do. Be ready. If you haven't got it yet, you'll get this. They say, look, everyone was selling their stuff. They were giving it to the apostles, and the apostles were distributing it out to everyone equally. Is that what it said? No, it's not what it said. Number one, not everybody was doing this. It said many were. In other words, it was a few people who the Lord put it on their heart to do it, and they did it. Few people, number one. Number two, did they distribute out everything that came in equally? No. It specifically went out only to those who had need. Only to those that had need. This was not socialism. This was not communism. This was simply, again, the response of those who were being led by the Spirit of God to voluntarily and willingly decide for themselves to give what they gave. It is important that you understand God did not command it. He did not command it then. He did not command us today. He didn't command them to sell all their stuff. That's scary. 
He did not command it, neither did the apostles command it. This was a voluntary thing of these people that were being led by the Spirit of God, and that's why they did it. Now, what I love about this is the example. When people have a hard time giving, what that shows is that they are not being led by the Spirit of God. I'll say it again. When people have a hard time giving, it shows that they are not being led by the Spirit of God because God is a giving God. He is a generous God. He gave His best. And when we are led by the Spirit of God, we too will be generous because we'll have the heart of God. Giving is not, will not be an obligation. It will not be, again, something that we're forced to do. When we're led by God's Spirit, we'll know we're being led by God's Spirit because giving will not be a burden to us. It'll be something we want to do. It'll be something that we will be recognized how lucky we are, how blessed we are, that we have something to give. And now, again, out of a thankful heart, we willingly give out of compassion because we see our brothers and sisters need it and we have it to give. This was the heart of the church. This was important, guys. Now let me move on quickly. Verse 36 and 37. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold the field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now Luke had just shared with us that there were many in the church that sold possessions, gave the money to the apostles to distribute to those in need. Luke now gives us a specific example. And he does this for a couple of reasons. Number one, he wants to show us that it was happening. Number two, he introduces to us a man by the name of Barnabas, okay? Now, if you know the book of Acts, you know Barnabas is going to be very important, okay? And we're now introduced to him. It's beautiful. Notice his real name was Joseph. You see that? A lot of people don't know his real name was Joseph. Why was his name changed? Well, Joseph was kind of a common name back then. And so, instead of calling him Joseph, they nicknamed him Barnabas. It means son of encouragement. We would say he's the encourager. That's who he is. Now, encouragement is a spiritual gift. So he was being named after his spiritual gift. And the beautiful thing is that starting here, we, we, we will see that every time we read about Barnabas, he's encouraging someone. Here, he's encouraging the church, right? He's encouraging the apostles. Later, he'll encourage the apostle Paul. Later on, he'll encourage his cousin John Mark over and over again. He was an encourager. And again, we'll learn about him as we continue on in the book of Acts. Let's turn to the second thing. After selflessness, we now turn to selfishness. Unlike selflessness that results in unity and blessing, selfishness results in division and consequence. Chapter 5, verse 1. But, and we'll stop right there. This is kind of sad, right? It's kind of sad. Luke has just told us God was moving, the church was focused, right? The kingdom of God was advancing, people are getting saved every day, and now he says, but. So he says, but. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now remember what's happening, okay? Very important, remember. Many, as Luke said, were doing this. They were selling property, they were selling possessions, and they were bringing the money before the apostles, and the apostles were distributing the money to those who had need. Can you imagine every time someone else did this? The church would go, praise the Lord, right? Right? Peter would go, yeah, awesome brother, awesome sister. Ananias and Sapphira, this couple, likely seen the recognition that Barnabas got. Ooh, wow, look at, oh, Peter praised him. Oh, he knows Peter's name. Oh, he got in good with the apostles. And they began to come up with a plan. Ooh, okay, I know how to get in good with, with the pastor, right? I know how to get in good with the apostles, and so they hatched this plan together, right? It says here, with his wife knowledge. 
that they too would sell some of their property and they would bring the proceeds to the apostles. But they decided that they would keep back, notice, keep back for themselves some of the proceeds and only bring a portion of that and lay it at the apostles' feet. Now, we're going to talk about why, because when you read that, it doesn't seem like there's anything wrong with it, but you'll, you will understand why in just a few minutes. Now, if you're taking notes, write this down. I like stuff like this. The name Ananias means God is gracious. That's what it means. The word Sapphira is where we get the word sapphire. Her name means beautiful. Now, I tell you these things because unlike Barnabas, who lived up to his nickname, he was an encourager, Sapphira was actually ugly in heart, and Ananias took advantage of the grace of God. So these people did not live up to their names. And the reason we know that is because in the original Greek, the word kept back. The word kept back is the Greek word nos physumai. It means to misappropriate. That's what the word means. Have you ever heard of someone misappropriating funds? It means to embezzle. It means to steal what doesn't belong to you. Very important. And so, what Ananias were doing is they were pretending that they were giving their all when they really weren't. It was a farce. It was a sham. They were being hypocrites. They were telling everybody, hey, we sold the property for this much, and here it is. But in all actuality, it was a lie because they were keeping back. They were misappropriating the funds for themselves. And so, verse 3, Peter said, Ananias... Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? Now remember what I said, God is a holy God and sin must be dealt with. Isn't that right? Cannot be tolerated. And so somehow God informs Peter, I believe through the Holy Spirit, of what Ananias and Sapphira had done. And so try to imagine the scene. Anna, Peter knows what's happening. Ananias comes before him, right? Probably like, you know, with the money, like, hey, everybody, look what I'm giving, right? Check this out. And he's walking up to Peter, right? Expecting Peter to go, praise the Lord, Ananias. God bless you. For the crowd, the church, those that had needs. Oh, thank you, brother. And this is what Ananias is expecting. He's expecting public recognition. That's why he's doing this publicly. But because his heart was wrong, because he was in sin, God had to deal with him publicly. And so in the midst of this, right, expecting praise, Peter calls him out. And Peter asks him a question. Ananias, why have you allowed Satan to fill your heart so that you'll lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, this is interesting because this teaches us something. Ananias and Sapphira had a choice. Does that make sense? They were Christians. They were believers. They were filled with God's Spirit, which means, remember this, one of the biggest blessings about being a Christian and being filled with God's Spirit is Satan can't possess you. Understand, he can possess anyone that is not saved. But the Bible teaches that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, Satan can't possess you. He can't control you. But what he can do is fill your heart with temptation. Whisper in your ear to influence you to give in to sin. And that's exactly what he did to Ananias and Sapphira. And so Peter asked him, why did you allow this? In other words, you had God's Spirit. You could have kept yourself filled with God's Spirit, but instead of doing that, you allowed Satan to fill your heart. And that's powerful for every believer. 
Because we want to blame Satan for everything sometimes, right? Oh, the devil made me do it. He can't make you do anything if you're a Christian. Unless you allow him to. Unless you allow him to. Now remember, when Jesus talked about Satan, he talked to the Pharisees in John 8, He told the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's what he did. He got them, Ananas and Ananas and Sapphira, to be just like him. To lie to God. To lie to the people of God. Pretending to be, oh, so generous like Barnabas when they were secretly, again, misappropriating the funds for themselves. Now, Peter tells them, notice, verse 4, while it remained unsold, in other words, before you sold it, did it not remain your own? Did, wasn't it yours? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? In other words, even after you sold it, wasn't the money yours? What's the answer? Yeah. It was theirs. They owned it. It was their property before they sold it. And even the money was theirs also. Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. What's Peter saying? Peter's telling Ananias, look, the property was yours. Even after you decided to sell it, which you decided to do, the money was yours. You didn't have to give any of it. God didn't command this. You were under no obligation. So why did you come up with this lie? You could have just said, hey, guys, I sold the property. This is how much I want to give, and that would have been fine. But you wanted to lie about it. You tried to impress others. You let your pride lead you to lie to God. This was you. In other words, Ananias, this was your fault. You did this. And because he did it, he faced the consequences. He would face the consequences. Now, before I move on really quickly, I want you to notice something always very important. Sometimes you hear people say that the Holy Spirit is not God. Have you ever heard that before? Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, they say that the Holy Spirit is not God. He's a force. That's how they describe him. He's like electricity, they say. He's like a force. Let me ask you, can you lie to electricity? Can you lie to a force? No. You can only lie to a person. And notice, in verse 3, Peter tells Ananias that he lied to the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 4, Peter tells Ananias that he lied to God. Because the Holy Spirit is God. Always remember that. Let's keep going. Verse 5. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young man rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Wow. Here Ananias had come, brought the money at the apostles' feet, and all of a sudden, he falls down dead at the apostles' feet. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is... That's what it says. Now, what's interesting about this is Peter didn't do this. Peter didn't do that. Peter was probably shocked that it happened. He didn't know this was going to happen. This was divine judgment, wasn't it? This was God purging sin from the church. This was God, we would say today, handling business. Scholars say that the reason God doubts so harshly, I mean, we're lucky it doesn't happen today. I think you'd agree with that. But the reason God doubts so harshly with Ananias was the same reason he doubts so harshly with Achan. Achan had stole back, right, and lied in the same way that Ananias had stole back and lied. God dealt with Achan at the beginning of the Israelites entering into the promised land. It was a new time, a new season for the Israelites. And God also dealt with Ananias at the very beginning of the church. 
it was necessary, right, that the church be established, that God deal with sin, pur- purge sin from the church specifically at this time. Verse 7. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Now, I think this is kind of interesting. Remember, her name is Sapphire, right? Beautiful. I have to ask myself, where was his wife at? Does that make sense? She was probably at home getting ready. That's probably what she was doing, okay? That's probably what she was doing. Remember, in their mind, this is going to be a celebration, right? Everyone's going to applaud them. And so she probably took three hours more to get ready than Ananias did, and so she finally shows up. That's the point. She finally shows up. Peter says, verse 8, Tell me whether you both sold the land for so much. And she said, yeah, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Peter first checked her, right? Wanted to find out, was this just your husband or were you in cahoots? Did you guys agree to this together, right? He wanted to know, were they in on, was she in on this? She lies just like her husband did. And Peter asked her, how did you guys think that you could test God? How were you guys trying to test God? Now, interesting. Many people today don't think that they test God. But do you understand when you deliberately choose to sin as a Christian, you're testing God. You're testing You want to know just how much you can get away with before you get in trouble. Before your sin catches up with you. And people do that, right? Let me see how far I can get. Let me tempt God. Let me dare God to see if he's going to stop me. To see if he's going to deal with me. We know that feeling with our kids, don't we? Especially when they're little. Oh, they test us, don't they? How much they can get away with before we take the belt off. That's the same thing we do. We don't admit it, but it's the same exact thing. Now, one of the sad things is Christians today who say this. Well, God's a forgiving God. I'm just going to repent after. I'm just going to go to church on Sunday, right? Next Sunday, I'll just go again. Let me ask you a question. Did, Did Ananias have time to repent? Did he have time to go to the next service to repent? No. It's important. We assume, again, that we have time. There's no guarantee. Ananias didn't have time, and guess what? Neither did Sapphira. Keep reading verse 9. Behold, Peter says, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. They shared the same sin. They shared the same judgment. And what's so powerful about this, again, what's so powerful about this, is this really teaches us a lesson as Christians. One of the sad things that, again, I'm just telling you what I've heard. People think that, well, God would never judge us, right? We're his children. God will never do that to a Christian. He might do it to an unbeliever, right? That's judgment, They deserve it, but God would never do that to his own. Ananias and Sapphira were part of the church. They were part of the church. And so this is here to teach us, right? That just because we're Christian doesn't exempt us from the judgment of God. We see the judgment of God. Interesting. Peter will later go on to write, 1 Peter 4, 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin where? The house of God. God has to bring judgment. God has to bring punishment. He has to deal with sin. He has to. This is necessary. John will later go on to write, 1 John 5, 16, John says, if you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, You should pray, and God will give them life. I refer to those 
whose sin does not lead to death. We recognize there are sins, all sin is wrong, all sin is sin, it's bad, but there are some sins that can kill you. John says, if you see a brother or sister sinning and their sin doesn't lead to death, pray for them, that God will restore them, God will have mercy upon them, God will spare their life. But he also says, there is sin that leads to death, isn't there? There is sin that leads to death. Just as we see again, Ananias and Sapphira faced the judgment of God, which was death. Now that's sad because that tells us that there are Christians who have died too early. That's what that means, right? That there are Christians that should have lived longer, but because of their bad choices, because of their sin, they faced the judgment of God. Verse 11, last verse. And great fear, remember, mega fear, phobia, and mega phobia from God came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Yes, this was sad. Yes, this was scary. Can you imagine how everybody talked about it? How many people knew Ananias and Sapphira and seen what happened to them? This taught the church that God is a holy God that you don't play with God, and that you better take sin seriously. Otherwise, you might end up facing the consequences of sin the hard way. Lord, help us to learn from this. Amen? Let's pray. Once again, Father, we thank you this morning, Lord God, for your word. Every text, every scripture, every word. It's all here for a reason, Lord. It's all here to teach us, to draw us closer to you, Lord, to remind us, Lord, how much we need you, how much we need your help, how much we need you to change us, change our heart, all of us. I pray that none of us have ever gotten to that place where we think that we've arrived already. We think we've already matured. We already, again, don't need to learn or don't need to change anymore. Help us, Lord, all of us. We're not there. None of us are. I'm far from it. Help us, Lord. Continue to make us more and more like your son, Jesus. Change us from the inside out, Lord. You do the work that only you can do. You be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please.